be in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. The marks of a faithful ministry. We could say minister. The marks of a faithful ministry. Second Corinthians chapter 6, if you want to just find your place there, we will be looking at that in a moment. Every day, we come in contact, I come in contact with people that need Jesus. Right? You come in contact uh, with people that, that need Jesus. They either need Him because they don't know Him at all, or they don't know Him very well, or they need Him close at that moment and to sense Him at that moment. And we are the ones that God has chosen to do that. It isn't the angels that He calls and says, this is what you're going to do. The angels will assist you. I know they will assist you. The Hebrews says that they're ministering angels to, uh, to, to minister to those who will inherit salvation. But they work with you. They don't do your job. They don't do my job. Every day I have the responsibility of reflecting Christ to that place that I go, wherever that's work, and UDF or wherever it is. That's my responsibility as a child of God. That's your responsibility. And if you're married, you have a responsibility to reflect Christ to your wife, to your husband. That's your ministry. To my children, that they may know Him and know Him better. To your children and grandchildren. And you are, the Hebrew says, you are the priest of God. That you're a minister. And Paul had dedicated the chapter, we're not going to read the chapter before it, but he had dedicated the chapter before it, talking about a particular word, ambassadors. He said, you are, we are ambassadors for Christ. And an ambassador makes known the world that they come from to, a, to another world, to a, one country that they leave, they represent that country to another country. And as an ambassador, that is exactly what we do. People don't have hope. They, they really don't. I can't judge them until they come to a place in their life where they have an opportunity to know Jesus. It's very difficult, and we should not... Be so hard on them until they first heard the message of Christ. And when they can hear that message, they can experience a new life. Now, I'm not saying that there, there should be standards and you set forth those standards, but this morning I'm talking about reflection of who He is. When we go into a workplace and we go into wherever we go and we, we, we pray with our kids or don't pray with our kids, are we reflecting His image? When we ride bicycles with kids or fix their flat tires on their bicycle or whatever it is that we do. Are we reflecting Christ or not reflecting Christ? When we give people our time and energy, are we reflecting Christ? And I'm sharing this message with you as ministers, as husbands and fathers and wives and mothers and lights and darkness and people who need encouragement. <clears throat> you need the encouragement to continue being the light. Because there are certain things that happen. Listen, if you've been in ministry, and I mean frontline ministry, not just pastoring, but you've been in a situation where you loved and you opened your heart and you've tried to reach out and you've prayed and you've sought the Lord and you've done everything you could for them and then you feel like they just stepped on you. Or they took and didn't give back. Then it hurts and it's easy to draw back. And say, I don't know if that's for me or not. And we might not even say those words, but we have a tendency when we've been hurt and we've been wounded and we haven't seen the results that we want to have to draw back. Listen, we are none of those, Scripture says, that draw back. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we're going to read the 13 verses here. And it says, as God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, 
In the time of my favor, I heard you. In the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way in great endurance and troubles and hardships and distresses and beatings and imprisonments and riots and hard work, sleepless nights, hunger, purity, understanding, patience and kindness in the Holy Spirit and sincere love, in truthful speech and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor. Bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak to you as my children. Open wide your hearts also. This morning I begin with the thought that we first need to have a heart to reflect Christ to the world. If we don't have the heart to reflect Christ to the world because we're so consumed with our own life, then we will never be able to first have an entryway into their, into their heart. And the Apostle Paul is talking about he opened wide his heart. He said... My heart's wide open to you. Paul said in verse 4, Rather as servants of God we commend ourselves in every way. And when you look at what he did and, and the things that he said, he's not just trying to build himself up in their eyes and he's not, or, or, or brag about himself. He said, but these are, these are the things that we did as servants of God. Because there were other people who were trying to be superior in, in their eyes and Paul was saying, listen, this is a servant of God and we have acted like servants of God and, and we need to have an attitude in this church individually and corporately as servants. And Paul's servanthood commends himself to others not just with words but with what he did. And it's interesting, nothing will reach a person's heart like servanthood. When they know that you're for them, When they know that you care and you care enough to spend extra time, when you care enough to pray for them and you really mean it and actually maybe even do it at that moment. It's the, I find it's the best thing to do it at that moment. While they're on the phone. While you're in their office. While you're in those situations. But you, you open your heart to them and you let yourself... Be real with them. That means you might cry in front of them. It means you might not. But you are being transparent and you are being real and you're willing to serve. We try to reach them because Christ died for them. We try to reach them because the good news can save them. Listen, if we don't have a heart for this, this message is going to mean nothing. The rest of it, nothing. Because in the, Ameri the American gospel is still about us. But the message that I'm preaching this morning is not about us. It is about what we can do. It is trying to encourage you to keep on shining your light. Keep on doing what you need to be doing. Keep on praying and interceding. Never give up. Keep on being faithful. Keep on reflecting Christ. Keep on giving. Keep on using the ministry that God gave you. But keep on keeping on. We try to reach people because we believe in what the gospel did for us. If the Gospels never really did anything for you, then it's probably not going to do anything for your neighbor until it first does something for you. But if your life's been changed, they're going to know about it. Amen. They're going to see it. If your life's not been changed and all you have is words, then we know what that's like, right? We've been around some that... You know, they, they, they got the words. They, they got everybody else's idea or the, their idea how everybody else needs to live their life. But you really just know that you know that you know their life's not where it needs to be. If only though they could hear the true good news, and I mean really hear and really see it in us, that Christ died in their place. If only they could know what Jesus is really like. Listen, even if they were to pick up the Bible... They wouldn't understand it. You understand that? 
Even if you gave them a Bible and they read it every day, until they come to a place and they believe in the good news, there's something over their eyes and they cannot see it. Good preaching. But if they can see it in you, it will make a difference. Yeah. It will do something on the inside of them. At least when the going gets tough, they can look at something that's solid and something that's real and something that's genuine. There's something that's not going to the bar at nine and they're not doing what the rest of the people are doing. They're different. They're set apart. They have something that other people don't have. It's our job. It's our ministry. It's our place in the world. If you've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, if you have been redeemed, you have a calling. You have a calling. We all have a calling. You know, when God calls people, it's on that day that we're saved. The actual calling in Scripture is the day that you're saved. And then at that point, God begins to assign what our responsibilities are in life, and He begins to speak to us about those, those things. But when you become a child of God, you become a priest of God. At that very moment, you have to reflect who He is. Amen. It is the heart of the Father that they be reached. If we spend enough time with Him, if our life is ingrained in Him enough, and that begins to work in us, and because that begins to work in us, His heart becomes our heart, and then we have the same passion that He has, and just as He says that we're not willing that any should perish, we're saying, I'm not willing that any should perish. No person... And I realize we're not going to save the world, though He made provision for the whole world through the shedding of His blood. We might not be able to save the whole world, but we live in this community and in this place, and there are souls to be reached. And when you go into that workplace, you are there as a light. Yes. And light shines better in darkness. You see, it's the heart of the Father that they be reached because He's not willing that they perish. He's with he, His desires. They come to a place of repentance and they turn their life around. He said, I came that they may have life and they may have it to its fullest. Listen to this. This is His heart for them. Every lost person, is they, they were not designed for hell. The hell was designed for the devil and his angels. They were not designed for hell. He said, I'm not willing that any parish or some churches out there who believe that this person gets chosen, this person don't get chosen. But I'm telling you, God will save any man who believes. Amen. And then that life is changed and it's transformed. Why? Because He wants them to have a good life. Yes. In this life and in the next. I'm going to tell you, because He's a Father... Brooke, who's very, uh, she can't sit still, whether in my lap or in a chair. She's very energetic, full of life, but God wants great things for her. And she's been for, for three years now or four, she's been riding a bicycle with training wheels. It's just, you know, I mean, that's how it's got to shake. Every time it hits a little rock, it just kind of shakes. And, and it hit a bump, and she's flipping over like a, you know. She, she said, this is the year, Daddy, I want the training wheels off. And so we took those training wheels off this week. And, of course, Mama's scared for her. But we took those training wheels off. And let me tell you something. She, I said, you got a pedal now, or you going to fall? But she learned to paddle, and she learned to keep going, and now she wants to ride all the time. That doesn't mean when she falls, I said, get back up. Get back up. You'll never learn to ride good until you get back up. But to see her smile, I'm tying this into the message. To see her get excited, just smiling ear to ear with those teeth missing. Just beautiful because she's happy. And she's doing what she's designed to do. She, 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 she's enjoying life. She's free. She's riding that bicycle. <clears throat> she's actually can now ride the bike when the other girls go off and we ride to the church sometimes. She can't do it without me. But we've been, I couldn't tell you how many trips we made to this church this week. 
But you don't want to look both ways, but we're working on it. <laughs> but when you, but this, but this is what God wants for you. That you find your place. That you soar. That you have life and you have it to its fullest. He wants that for you. Amen. He wants that for the world. He never intended for them to be captivated by sin. To be bound by addiction. To be bound by things that controlled their life and passions and lusts. He designed them in a way that when they come to Him, it, they can have life and they can have it to its fullest. So when we preach and teach, we reflect the grace of God in all areas of our life for one reason. Well, for several reasons. We want to have integrity. We want to be right before God ourselves. But we do it that they may see Jesus. They, 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 they need to see that He's alive. That's why I believe in signs and wonders and these need to be done in our, in, through our life. Because they need to see that God is alive, but they also need to see the love of Jesus. <clears throat> so we need to have a heart to reflect Christ to the world. First of all, we've got to have that heart. Then we've got to have a determination to endure because if you've been doing it long enough to know your heart gets stepped on. When I was called into the ministry or accepted my place in life, it was standing behind a pulpit and preaching to people and ooh, that was such a wonderful time. I mean, that, that was the, the image that was in my mind. It wasn't the nitty gritty of the problems and the issues and the burdens and the counseling and the, the concern and the hurts and the pains and, and the doubts and the people leaving and the people coming back. But church, we must learn to endure. And the Apostle Paul, they weren't quitters, but they were devoted to the cause. They knew what their place was in life. They knew that Christ had changed their heart and they must reflect that to the world through preaching and teaching and through the reflection of their own life. And Paul said, I, we've experienced trouble and hardships and distresses. And life has problems, don't it? But the good thing, he said, I've overcome the world. We, we have victory. He says, I've overcome the world. <laughs> or we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And we may not be persecuted the way they were shipwrecked or bitten by a snake, but we face trouble, we face difficult times, and we face uh, issues and things that come up that, that try to press us and mold us and cause us or to want to cause us to draw back. But we have to let those things work for us. Let me just say it this way. We can't change anybody anyway. You understand that? Amen. But the gospel can and there is, a, there is a place that when we're in pain and we're hurting, that God can take that and use that to make you an on-fire intercessor prayer warrior. He can take you in weakness and cause you to depend upon Him and that you find strength that you never had any other time or any other place because you have nothing but Him. And in that weakness... It becomes strength. And you're able to do things that you couldn't do. And your anointing increases. And you're able to preach that penetrating word of God to them and teach that word to them that it pricks their heart. If we open our eyes in the midst of the troubles and the things that we face, we will find there are people everywhere who are going through trouble and are going through hard times and they just need somebody to come alongside them. Right. Amen. They need somebody that's going to love them, that's going to pray for them, that's going to put their arm around them, men with men and women with women, and, and, and as much as possible. That doesn't mean when you go to work tomorrow you can't minister to the lady at work, but you need to be very careful. There's a time and a place where you don't have other, any other choice, but don't do it in her car. Okay, I'm not even trying to be funny here. 
Do it in a safe place. Don't do it behind closed doors. But minister to people because people need somebody to minister to them. Amen. He says in beatings and imprisonments and riots, yet he continued to preach and teach the name of Jesus. We face a little bit of persecution in our life. We're so spoiled that we're ready to draw back immediately. Man, we cannot be ashamed of Jesus. We cannot be ashamed that we are tongue-talking, spirit-filled, Bible-believing Christians. We cannot be ashamed of that. That we don't have to start doing it in front of them at that moment. <laughs> but we don't need to be ashamed. We need to stand up for who we are and in Christ. If we face any type of persecution, we must face it. Because it says, and Jesus said these words, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble, persecution comes, because of the Word, they quickly fall away. Listen, you and the Word, me and the Word, must be in complete alignment. You understand? That Word's hard work. That Word is higher than we are. It's a higher standard than we are. But we need to be in absolute, complete alignment with the Word of God. And let me tell you something, if you're absolutely and completely in alignment with the Word of God, you will say things and do things or not do things that will bring offense to people and you have to make a decision, are you going to go with God or are you going to go with the world? Right. Now our personalities don't need to offend people. If they do, we need to tell them we're sorry. But if that Word does, we can't help it. Not everybody will like their message. Jesus said they hated me. If they hated you, it's because they hated me first. I remember early years of being a Christian when I was trying to be celibate. I was, I was, I was single and I separated myself from the girlfriend that I, I lived with. And I was trying to be absolutely pure. And, 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 and I worked in a small place called James Block and Brick Company. And, 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 and I had two bosses that I worked with. And it's interesting, I had two bosses and one staff, and that was me. <laughs> and neither one of them knew the Lord, and they both went home and drank. But God put me in the midst of them, and, when, and, and even though I heard the nasty talk, and, and, and they, they ridiculed me for my stance, or at least one of them ridiculed me for my stance on purity, and, and, and so it must be something weird with you. You must be gay. Well, I, I'm serious. All kinds of stuff like that. And of course, one of them said, well, he's not gay. He's, he loves the Lord, you know. But the other one just had no grace whatsoever. And so I went out on that forklift, sometimes with tears. I didn't try to let, let them see it. And prayed for them and sought God for them. And let me tell you something. Because I stood strong, when they went through things, when the one man's son killed himself, it wasn't the other guy that he was going to for comfort. It wasn't the other guy that he was going to for counsel, but he was, he was coming to the one that he believed had some hope. Yes. And church, what I want to tell you is if you will do it long term and you will live your life in front of them long term, you will build a name for yourself, his name. They will understand who you are. They will understand your integrity and your character and your compassion and your love and that you're, faith, you're a faithful person. You're not in one day and out the next. They've had enough of that. They've had daddies like that. They need somebody who's there, who's solid. Bill, great guy. I love Bill. He, didn't, he went home every single night he, he bragged about his RV and he would go out to his garage because his, him and his wife didn't have a good relationship. So he, had a, he built a garage just for his RV and him. Right. And he would go out there and wash it and drink his beer and sometimes just come to work so hungover he just wanted to lay down the dirty floor. <laughs> what a life. Ooh, I wish I had that life. <laughs> but he would... But at the same time, he would pull out some money and he'd kiss. He said, because he, he wanted me to try to be a salesman like him. And, and he said, you know, I, 
I, I could help you make a lot of money. And, you know, at that point, I'm living in a trailer. I didn't have a car that leaked oil. I didn't have a lot. And, you know, so, so oh, sounds good. He said, but you're going to have to have some mixed drinks when we go out and meet with other salesmen. And I said, well, I can't do that. Amen. But he stood out. But I remember we sat down on the showroom floor one day in a chair, a couple of chairs, and he began to cry like a little child. And he says, I'm miserable. My life is miserable. I didn't say, well, I know that. <laughs> you see, people will begin to open up when they know we care. And they will begin to open up when they know we're stable. And they know we're consistent. I was at the jail ministry probably three years before I began to see any evidence, any serious evidence coming out of it. And I'm not saying it has to take that long for you, Rusty, because you have a great anointing upon your life. But for me, it took me about three years. I had to earn the right. And because if you understand how the Helen County Jail works, they're in one day, they might be out the next or the next week, and then they get called again, of course. And they come back, and you get to see them again. It's literally like your own congregation, literally. Very few times have I been there that I had not known at least some of them. I mean, one guy said, man, I've heard your testimony so many times. <laughs> they, they, they can almost tell it. <laughs> but it's interesting. that you, Then you come along these, see, you, you come in one day and, they, and something happens in somebody's life. Right, brother? Something happens in somebody's life when they hear the good news and they take it. And it begins to work in their life. And it's not just about being free. It's a, uh, free from drugs. It's about being free. Amen. It's about experiencing the Lord and having a relationship with Him. Amen. Stability. Long term. Don't faint. Not everybody will like our message. We keep going. We keep doing it. The Apostle Paul said, we've had hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger. Now this doesn't sound like the American message, does it? Hard work, sleepless nights, hunger. You know, you tell some Christians that you've had sleepless nights, and they're going to start asking, is there any sin in your life? You need to get some bread. You need, are you drinking too much coffee? Just maybe. There's something on the inside of you that sometimes doesn't allow you to sleep because you care more for what's going on around you and you care about the pain of others and the things that's going on in their life that just maybe that's what's keeping you up. You start praying through those things and maybe the devil lets you sleep. Hard work. Paul had to earn his own living by the sweat of his brow many times, making tents. Because he didn't want to offend. He didn't want to say, he's just doing this for money. And so, he, he gladly did whatever he had to do. Could you imagine working all night? They didn't just have Sunday morning church back then. And Sunday night church. And, and Wednesday night church. He preached every day. When he went, During that period of time, he would work during the day, preach at night. Monday. Get up Tuesday, work all day, preach on Tuesday night. Get up on Wednesday, work all day, preach Wednesday night. Over and over and over and over. That takes dedication. It takes discipline. It takes being single. <laughs> Maybe impossible. <clears throat> we need to make sure that we understand what hard work is. Don't be afraid of working hard. If you, go to, if you have a job, you need to be the hardest worker there. Get there 10 minutes. This is a different sermon. 10 minutes, at least 10 minutes before work starts and be willing to stay longer if they ask for overtime. Do it. It'll be good for us. I'm not trying to meddle. We need to learn how to work hard. But there's another working hard that when a man prays, there's these sweet times, right? Man or woman. And there's these sweet times. We go to prayer and 
It's just a sweet time with the Lord. But then there's those other times when you just can't. It isn't that sweet. It's just you know you've got to pray for a brother that's hurting or a sister that's hurting and, and you're having to carry their pain and you're standing in a gap for them and you and you keep praying. And, and I've, I've had times like this where you linger and pray until you pray through. Paul endured damp dungeon floors and being in the sea through the night, but there was also nights, I believe, nights of prayer. We see the life of Jesus. He pulled away that he might be able to go and be at the Father. It wasn't just, now I lay me down to sleep prayers. It wasn't just prayer over meals. It was, Lord, I need you. God, I need you. I, need, I, I, I count on you. I need you. I need a relationship with you. My husband needs a relationship. It needs to be real for him. Then in purity and understanding and patience and kindness and the Holy Spirit and in sincere love, he says, he remained pure in spite of circumstances and temptations. Some people, when things don't go their way, they just want to go out. I'm just telling you like it is. When things don't go their way, they want to go out and satisfy their flesh in some way and reward themselves. Things did not go Paul's way all the time. He says, I die daily. And he didn't just go satisfy himself. You work with people. It's not like working on an assembly line. I wish sometimes it was. Yes. That when we get finished, we could put a little stamp on it. Sears. I worked at a place where they made air conditions. And, and somebody's job was just to put the sticker on it. If it was a Sears product, Sears went on. If it was somebody else's, it was somebody else's sticker. And when that job is done, great. But people aren't that way because they're never done. I'm never done. They're never done. And if you're going to minister to people, you need to know they're not done. They may have an awesome testimony. I may have an awesome testimony. But God's not done. I may come to you one day and cry on your shoulder. Are you going to be there? Amen. Paul didn't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. He says impurity. He didn't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. He didn't want to do things that were questionable. You cannot be in ministry and live in the gray. You cannot. You are not going to be effective and live in gray areas. Just not going to happen. Paul didn't want to allow his soul to hate. He says insincere love. He didn't want it to be false. He said insincere love. He didn't want his soul to hate. If your soul hates, you need to get rid of that. You need to get rid of it just as soon as you can. If you've got any unforgiveness in your heart toward anybody, you need to get rid of it. If you've been carrying unforgiveness for a husband or a spouse, you need to get rid of it. It's dangerous. It will harden your heart. Get rid of it. He says in truthful speech and in the power of God with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left. You see, Paul didn't want to be found of being manipulative. He didn't want to be found sharing half-truths and lying. He didn't want to be found as a person who tells people what they want to hear and not what they need to hear. You know, there are people who tell you what you want to hear. And I, and, I, and I found this. When you really want to hear that, you can find it. I promise you. When you want to do the wrong thing, somebody out there will give you permission. Yes, they will. That doesn't mean it's right. And we need to have an attitude that we're going to stick to what's right. Even though it may be difficult for me because I love you and I don't want to hurt you. But when I know you're doing something wrong, I just have to tell you. I don't mean I meddle in your business, but when something's so obvious and something's so clear, and Scripture says the simple nature is obvious. When something's so obvious and so clear, don't be surprised if you walk away wounded. Because my job is to help you get up there where you need to get. That's the reason I tell Brooke, if you fall, get back up. She, she had shorts on. I said, you can't wear shorts riding a bicycle for the first time. <laughs> she walked away crying. Yeah. And my flesh 
I want to say, wow, we'll see what happens. But I didn't. I said, get you some pants on. And then she had a rack. And she got skin up a little bit, not too bad. But if she would had shorts on, it would have been bad. But because I love her enough that I don't want to see her get hurt, I tell her the truth. Not everybody's going to love you because you tell them the truth. Now there's a way that we can tell the truth and be mean. <coughs> but there's a way we can tell the truth in love. And Paul says, speak the truth in love. Find a way to let your words be sweet, but tell the truth. He says, I'm genuine, yet regarded as imposters, known, yet regarded as unknown. He had opponents that tried to undermine and trash his reputation. And, and just because Paul gets thrown in prison and stuff like that, they're thinking, well, why y'all want to follow that guy? He's got chains on. But the problem, the problem with that is Paul was in chains because he was doing what's right. And because he was ruffling the wrong feathers. And he's speaking the word that words that were difficult for people to hear. He says, dying yet we live on, beaten yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich. There's something about it. Listen, I, I'm excited when I preach the gospel to the poor and to those who don't have anything because God took me when I didn't have nothing and blessed my life. I'll tell you, if my wife had met me in those days, she would have nothing to do with me. I see my kids out there playing, Brooke running around, so thank you, God, for kids. What an inheritance. What a blessing. But the gospel is what does it. Now, there are people out there raising kids that probably shouldn't. <laughs> Or they need some help. But they need some assistance and they need some help. And I'm not perfect either. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that that gospel message does something that can take somebody who don't have anything and don't know anything, who's simple-minded and just don't know how to live life and change their life. Yes. Yeah. Don't underestimate the gospel. Yeah. Man, I graduated. It took me five years to graduate high school. Okay, I took English more times than I did than I than, than I I failed it more times than I took it, and I wasn't good in math. I mean, I barely made it through high school. When I got saved, I had to look up more words than I could read. Honestly, a friend gave me the, a Webster dictionary. And said, "Use it." God, the Lord, is speak a word to me. I said, "What does that word mean?" I didn't even know what the word procrastinate meant. I remember I was in the laundry mat and I said, Lord, I want to be a soul winner. He said, I said, what's my problem? He said, you're procrastinating. I said, what does that mean? <laughs> I'm serious. He talked to me like that. I'm sorry. And so I went home, got the dictionary, procrastinate, putting off. And I began to understand things. But what I'm saying to you is the gospel is what works. Listen, propping a man up doesn't work. I worked in, in I worked in a place where they gave a man points if he could have a good day, and he he got to graduate if he got enough points. That doesn't work. What works is dying to our flesh, but believing in Jesus Christ, dying to ourselves, and living for Him. That works. That's what works. I'm sorry, get rid of all the other stuff and believe on the one thing, which is the cross. That's what saves people. That's what touches lives. Paul says we do preach a message of wisdom to the wise, to, or to the or basically to the ones that are already saved. They'll preach a message of wisdom, but the message we preach to you is the cross. That's what he said in 1 Corinthians. It's foolishness to the world that is perishing. We preach the cross and him crucified. Or Christ had been crucified. Joey didn't pull himself up by his own bootstraps a year and a half ago. Rusty didn't pull himself up two, two or so years ago by himself. I didn't all of a sudden in the 1990s, I think I'll change. No, I heard the gospel. 
And I became ashamed of my sin. I did. I became ashamed of who I was. Amen. And the police came that night and helped it go a little deeper. <laughs> Don't they? God just had put a little icing on that cake. Woke up the next morning, put on those same nasty clothes and went to church. Gave my life to Jesus. But the shame helped me. Let people feel guilt so that they may come to Jesus. Yeah. Listen. In spite of the hardships that we face, we must keep our hearts open. I don't know if I'm preaching to myself or not. I'm sure I am. And I'll tell you one of the things that inspires me is when I do look at changed lives. And I do look at the, the things. I, I, I thank, thank you, Chip, for sharing the baptismal. Mm. To look and see that it's worth it. Amen. It's worth me working two jobs. I can complain sometimes. I can. And part of my complaining is to feel I feel like I'm not giving you enough. I do. I feel like I'm not giving you my best because I do have to work another job. But in spite of the hardships that we may face, we must keep our hearts open even if people's response is less than ours. Focus on the good. If you've got some good going on, focus on that good. And focus on what you see going on and what you see God doing. <clears throat> Paul says, and I'm going to read this to you in verse 11 through 13. It says, We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. And we've opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. And he says, as a fair exchange, I speak as to my children, open wide your hearts also. And what I want to share about this particular part is Paul is urging them, open your hearts. He said, we've opened, it. We've opened our hearts completely open. I mean, they are completely open. Now, listen, you know, you have a heart that's completely open. It's, it's a dangerous thing. And, and, and the reason why I say it's a dangerous thing, it's a dangerous thing in this sense, it will get hurt. Now, let me tell you what's more dangerous. When you close it. And you don't let anybody in. You don't never let nobody touch you. You don't never, you can't feel nothing. You're not moved by compassion. You're not, you're not moved at all by your...